Yeah. All right. Well, welcome to another episode of Inside America's Minds. Today we have with us Joshua Shea. So Josh is probably one of the world's most experts on pornography. He has appeared on over 200 podcasts and radio shows and educating people not only in America, but throughout the world on pornography. In addition, uh, according to Josh's bio, he has also given more interviews on the topic of pornography than anybody else in the world. And I read through his bio, I read through 17 pages of guest appearances and read his book reviews, and wow. So Josh, it's an honor to have you here today on Inside America's Mind. You also are the founder of RecoveringPornAddict.com, RecoveringPornAddict.com. Moreover, like I mentioned before, you have written multiple books about pornography, which we'll learn more about towards the end of the show. You've had a successful career as an award-winning journalist, a prominent magazine publisher, film festival founder, and you've even been a politician in central Maine where you currently live with your wife and two children. So again, I want to just say it's a privilege to have you on Inside America's Minds, which you know is about everyday people with extraordinary experiences. And your life, when I read through everything, your life experiences have been extraordinary, without a doubt. All right. And um, so one of the questions on the guest information form I asked is, why would you like to be on Inside America's Minds? Do you remember what your answer was? I do not, to be honest with you. You said to make Jody happy. Well, Jody's right. very happy on the show because yeah. there's so many people who are involved and so many couples that experience pornography what I want to ask you is give us an idea of the statistics of pornography in the United States. Well, um, you know, they're all over the place and, and uh, depends on who you want to listen to uh, for certain things. Like, for instance, the, the, the uh, value of the pornographic industry. I have seen anywhere from $3 billion to $150 billion dollars. Um, mm. So, uh, you know, I, I don't know. Um, most of the statistics, I think, are outdated because of the pandemic. Ah, everything, good point. Everything has changed during the pandemic. Um, I'll tell you the scariest pre-pandemic statistic that I share with a lot of people is that there's an organization called the Barna Group. I believe they're out of Texas or they were commissioned by a group in Texas to do a study back in uh, 2018. And... Okay. They interviewed thousands of men, and what they found, scariest thing that's out there, is that in the 18 to 30-year-old uh, male group, 33% said that they either have a problem with pornography, they know they watch too much pornography, or they believe that they are in full-on pornography addiction. So that's wow. one, out of th one out of three men under 30 believe they have some kind of negative issue with pornography that's a very very big deal because Absolutely. these guys these guys are going to turn 40 and they're going to turn 50 and there are going to be more people behind them so if we don't see if we don't start addressing pornography if we don't start educating people about pornography um, i think that uh, we are looking 30, 40 years down the uh, road here, not just at a sexually unhealthy society, but at a, at a sexually diseased society. And, you know, I've, I've spoken to a few of my colleagues about this and uh, a few of them who actually see the pediatric population have predominantly young males as young as eight years old engaging in pornography. And when I was doing a little bit of the research I mean, over 40 million people engage in online pornography. 
that we're aware of. And like you said, that's probably an outdated statistic with the pandemic. And we're seeing a lot of everything during this pandemic. So my questions to you, and again, I wanna thank you because you're educating me as well as America on this. So how old were you, Josh? When you had your when you had your earliest memory of having engaged in pornography, well, um, as far as what we you know call hardcore pornography, that kind of stuff. I mean, I think we had HBO growing up. I I, I know that I'd seen you know naked people before, but um, the moment that I saw hard or no, probably not the moment. Probably thirty seconds after I saw my first hardcore pornography at about the age of 12, um, I was hooked. I, how, how were you hooked? What does that feel like? It feels like a light shined down from above. A warm feeling came over me, a sense of calm, a sense of ease. And I'm 12 years old. I mean, I, I, I don't know how, I mean, I can look back and say there was clearly trauma there, but I don't know how much stress, I don't know how much anxiety I had on a day-to-day -day basis but my older cousin shows me these magazines and I can't tell you even what they were called or what I saw on the page, but I just remember this intense feeling of just peace washing over me. Like I'd figured out the answer to a question that had been nagging me. And wow. the only other, the only other time I've ever felt this. And when people say, I don't think pornography addiction is a real thing. I share with them that the only other time I felt this kind of, uh, peace wash over me was about two years later, the first time that I ever got drunk at a wedding. And suddenly I understood, oh, wow, this is why people do this, because I am now a better version of me. I am better looking. Mm. I'm a better dancer. I'm funnier. Everything about me when I drink is better because I just don't feel the pain. And I figured this out at 14 years old. And so from from 14 years old forward, I was both a porn addict and an alcoholic until I was 37 years old. And no matter where I was in life, whether I was in high school or college or into my career, whether I was dating or married, it didn't matter where I was in my timeline hmm. from 14 to 37, is that the only two things that I could count on to be there for me and to give me relief were the pornography and the alcohol. So it was a disengaging of what we would refer to as the frontal lobes, the higher cortical functioning, the thinking part of the brain. And you said, I was a better version of me. For alcohol, yes. I would okay. absolutely say alcohol was about numbing for me. It okay. was about detaching. Um, however, the uh, pornography as I kind of did the autopsy on my addiction in recovery, mm. uh, I, I, I came to really understand how the pornography was about my control. Uh, in, 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 my, in my trauma of the abuse that I suffered as a child, uh, I gave up a lot of control and, and that's not my personality type. I don't even think it was back then. And I think that at some point I, on a subconscious level, promised myself I would not give up control ever again. I think this is why I ran my own companies. This is why uh, even when I was working for other people, I was very independent. This is why um, I ran for local office. Uh, this is why I started a film festival. I wanted control. I've always been a bit of a control freak. And when you think about pornography, you are in control mm. of that sexual world. Nobody on the page or on the computer screen is ever going to tell you no. You know, I, I okay. may be shot down by women, not, not me, I'm, I'm married, but I as a user may be shot down by women in real life. Women may not want to talk to me, or maybe I'm secretly attracted to men and I don't want to tell anybody or whatever it may be, when I get there in front of a computer or with my with magazines, uh, nobody says no to me. Nobody says, hey, you got to take out the trash. Nobody says, hey, you're five minutes late to work. What's the deal? There are no crying kids who need anything. I am in control of my world. If I want 
a a blonde girl, I get a blonde girl. If I want okay. an Asian girl, I get an Asian girl. If I want five men, two girls, you know, a leprechaun and somebody throwing fish sticks while country music <laughs> plays, I'm sure I can find that online these days. Nobody can say no to me. So there's a sense of power and a sense of control that came from pornography that if you look at my lifeline or, or and my, my timeline of life, um, during those roughest parts, during the, those down times, you're there, you know, during when, when life was getting me down, I can see that both my alcohol and my mm. porn absolutely shot up. They were so absolutely I, uh, panaceas for, for the, the, the bad feelings in my life. And I want to go back because you kind of slipped in there the trauma in childhood. Can you can you talk a little bit about that and then make the correlation uh, chronologically with the childhood trauma in relationship to the start of pornography and then the yeah. alcohol? It, it, I think that uh, and and you know I can I can uh, don't have any problem sharing. Uh, I was at the same babysitter from very early, uh, probably two months old to around seven years old. Um, I went to this babysitter when my parents were at work. My parents were both elementary school teachers. Um, okay. and they'd, they'd bring me there 7.30 in the morning. They'd pick me up 4.30 in the afternoon. Um, I don't remember anything from being a little kid there, but from the ages of like three to five, before I started school, um, there was uh, a lot of sexual inappropriateness uh, bordering on to abuse. And I guess it is abuse. I just have heard so many horror stories that mine mm -hmm. don't go up to, but it, it, it was sexual abuse. Absolutely. Uh, you were a child. Was, was the caregiver male or female? Uh, she was female. She female. was female. And the thing is, in looking back now, I can rec and there was far more mental and emotional abuse there right. than sexual. Yeah. I can look back and recognize objectively that she had a lot of problems. She should not have been taking care of, of children. She herself uh, had massive OCDs. Uh, I she would she had no floors in her house, only carpeting everywhere, every, everywhere, mm -hmm. and she would vacuum it four or five times a day. Everything. And I would have to follow along, picking up any little dot of lint the entire way. Were you um, the only child there that she was no, caring my for? My, my brother was also there. He was two and a half years younger than me. And there were other kids who came in and out. I don't think any other kids were there more than a year or two, but hmm. there were other ones that came in and out. There was never more than four at a time, uh, always right around my age group. Um, and... You know, she, she did things like she would comb my hair roughly with with a with a comb, probably fifteen times a day. Did uh, you ever tell mom and dad about this? No, 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 and I'll tell you why in a sec. Uh, and, and one other thing, she called me George. She called you her, George. I asked her why once, and she said, "I just like the name better than Josh." And so when I was at that house, I responded to George because it was just easier than, than causing trouble. And you ask about my parents. Um, when I was a little kid, my favorite mm. book was The Five Chinese Brothers, uh, where it's roll over, roll over, yeah. and they all end up out of bed. Uh, and there was a show on PBS. I don't know if it was Reading Rainbow or what it was, but some there was a show that was going to have a kind of cartoon depiction of the book that I wanted to see. And my mom found it like at 10 in the morning or 11 in the morning, whatever it was. And uh, when we went to my babysitter's house that morning, my mom asked her if I could watch it. She said, yes, no problem, no problem. That's just fine. Uh, when it got to be 10 or 11, you know, Price is Right was still on. And I was scared to death to say anything to change wow. the channel because I didn't know if she'd go off the handle. So that night, my mother asked me, did you see the Five Chinese Brothers show? And I said, no, I, 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 she forgot to put it on. I didn't tell her. And so I thought that was that. The next day when my mother drops me off, she's like, you know, Josh didn't get to see the Five Chinese Brothers show. And he was very disappointed by that. Well, she 
started crying and the babysitter started crying and apologizing and you know please don't fire me and we'll find another time that it's on and blah 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 so my mom said you know it's not a big deal and we'll we'll figure it out it just say you know i just wanted to mention that he did want to see it so she my mom left within 10 minutes this babysitter turned on a dime and started getting really angry at me and being like you know i don't want to get fired because of you and you know you should have said something what's wrong with you and, oh and, and it was, it was, it was very harsh. Uh, you know, th th like I said, there was a lot of mental and emotional trauma. She would send me, you know, I, if it was a nice day outside, nice being relative, but if it was a nice day, she might send me outside at 11 in the morning. And I didn't see her again until my parents came and picked me up at four, four 30. I was just in the backyard all day by myself. You know, I would, I would go pee in the woods. I, I, if I was hungry, I was hungry. I didn't go and ask her for anything because I didn't want her to fly off the handle at me or my brother or any of the other kids there. So I think, I, like I said, I stopped going to her seven, eight years old. Um, I think that I started, or at least in, in enough reading that I've done and, and mm -hmm. theorizing about my situation, I think what the, the pornography and the alcohol allowed me to do was to successfully repress those thoughts and to successfully put them into a part of my brain where I largely, I don't want to say forgot about it, but was able to, you know, largely detach from it. You know, as, as I grew up, I remembered, you know, somewhere around probably 30, 31 years old, my mom mentioned that this babysitter died. She saw the obituary in the newspaper. How did you and feel that your perpetrator, was, your abuser died? You were happy. Well, but I, I was happy. The uh, feeling of, of happiness came over me, but I don't think that I, I, or I, I know that I was not fully engaged with what she had done to me. I was just happy that she was dead. And it wasn't until I went to my first I went to my first rehab in 2014 for alcoholism. And it was towards the end of my time there that my caseworker recognized I had some issues with pornography that I always just thought were offshoots of my alcoholism, to be honest. I, when I, I never really uh, heard the term pornography addiction until I was in my first rehab. And so this caseworker, okay. he had me, or, or yeah, caseworker, he had me meet with a certified sex addiction therapist off campus. Um, and for the last couple of weeks that I was at this rehab out in California, and I met with this guy a couple of times a week, and he helped me understand uh, that my I had a pornography addiction, that it predated uh, my alcoholism, and mm -hmm. it didn't take very long to tap into, uh, you know, where it began, because I was starting to have certain memories come back. I was so, starting to have issues come back as the okay. alcohol got out of my system for the first yeah, time. Because you, know, you weren't able to repress that. Exactly, exactly. I have to ask you, uh, I have so many questions to ask you, but did she offend your brother as well? I remember, I remember one specific incident of sexual shaming uh, that I was actually forced to join into as far as shaming him. Um, and uh, oh he, he, do, he doesn't remember it, um, thankfully, but, uh, and, and I don't really go too deep with him on it. If he, if he truly doesn't remember it, I don't see any reason to, uh, you know, open up any wounds that aren't there. Um, but uh, I, uh, yeah, I, I, I remember far more being done to the other kids, including my brother, than I remember me. I only remember sexually, uh, sexually, I remember uh, two or three different incidences. Um, and, and one of them, it took me years to accept the fact it wasn't a positive thing. Um, I was going to ask you at what age, well, first, when did your parents find out and was this individual ever convicted? Did people come forward? I, uh, my parents found out, I think, when I was 38 or 39. I oh, my out. gosh. How, how did they respond to that? Uh, 
my dad shortly after read my first book, which talked about it, and mm. he kind of wrapped his arms around it. Um, I have always been a little prince in my mom's eyes, and she doesn't want to think anything bad has ever happened to me or that I could do anything bad. So mm. I think that she, I think she heard about it. I think that she felt bad about it. And I think that she recognized very quickly the only way she was going to cope with it was to uh, repress it or stamp it down or pretend okay. it didn't happen. My mother has never read any of my books. My mother has never listened to any of my podcasts. Um, she was not interested in watching my TED talk. And that's fine. I, I respect that. It's probably that. too, too overwhelmingly yep. hurtful. Yep. I I, I, yeah. And she's had trauma in her own past. So mm -hmm. I, I absolutely respect that. Um, and uh, as far as this woman, no, I mean, this was the early 80s and kids didn't talk. And uh, no, I, I, I once I got out of there, I put that behind me. And I, I think you, I you put it behind you consciously, but subconsciously, right. the trauma was established. The PTSD post-traumatic stress was probably very complex moving on because then there was the alcohol to self-medicate, as we say. Is there any family history of alcoholism or, yes. or substance abuse? So Yes. And I tell you what's interesting is that three of my four grandparents uh, were pretty serious alcoholics my parents were both total teetotalers. I have only seen my dad drink wine twice in my life. I've never seen my mother drink at all. We had a very, very dry house. And I was raised almost with this comical belief that if alcohol ever touched my lips, I would be a homeless vagrant laying in the street within five or six minutes probably. Uh, you know, I'd be like the guy on the Bugs Bunny cartoons with the bottle that has two X's on it yeah. with, the, <laughs> with the fumes coming out of it, a hiccuping and, you know, stumbling. And the first time that I had alcohol at that wedding, I think it was like, oh, this is not what they described. And, and your brain that... instantly went for it because it was predisposed uh, through the I, genetic I, I predisposition. It made, it made me feel better. I don't know how much. I, I know genetics play a part in things. Mm -hmm. I don't think they play a part in things as much as we may believe when it comes to addiction. I believe that a lot of people use that as a bit of a crutch, but my brother has no addictions whatsoever. Uh, many people in my family have no addictions. I believe that DNA, you know, does set a, a platform for this, but I also made a lot of stupid decisions in my life, uh, you know, and, and That's I, what I love you know, about you, Josh, you are so real. And I would, yeah. I would say that I agree with you. I don't think it's any one thing when you look at the orchestration of a human being and their emotion, thought behavior, I think it's, it's a combination of things. I think there is a predisposition there genetically, but I think it's also the earlier trauma and right. just the environmental. And um, so when, when were you diagnosed, and you had mentioned when you were in rehab, but when were you actually diagnosed as alcohol dependent, pornography addicted, and then you had also disclosed to me uh, during, we were both guests on Sharifa Hardy's show, the roundtable talk show out of LA, but you had also disclosed that you had bipolar disorder formerly yes. known as manic depression with the highs and lows of the moods. So when did that all come to, uh, when was that all laid out on the table for you come to fruition and you had a, a look inside what was really going on with you? Uh, I, I was, I knew something was up with me different around 17, 18. Okay. When, uh, and, and, and I will say that, I was drinking and looking at porn almost every day by the age of 15. Um, I, again, this, this was this, we're now talking early nineties. Um, mm. If you remember, this was around the time when Blockbuster and some of these large video stores were putting the mom and pops out of business. So I found a mom and pop video store that just trying to hold on, they would rent anything to anybody. So one day I went to the back room, you know, behind the saloon doors and uh, I, I 
went and I grabbed two porno movies and I went up to the counter where I rented movies quite a bit and I plopped them down. I rode my bike there. I didn't even have my car license. Oh my yet. gosh. Plopped my plopped the two pornos down and they rented them to me without even batting an eyelash. And then I would ride my bike a quarter mile down the street to this one convenience store, again, independently owned that everybody knew you could buy beer at. And at 15 years old, I, I never had the guts to bring a six pack up to the table. I always brought like four bottles up to the table. Uh, I don't know why I, I didn't, but I'd, I'd bring up four bottles. They would sell them to me, no problem. And I would, there I would be with my backpack riding home after school on my bike with bottles clanging in the back with porno movies in the back and then my homework in my backpack my and, god and and were you excited about getting home and oh absolutely absolutely i'd get home i would uh go to my room and because by 14 15 i had my own vcr and tv in my room so before my parents came home from work I would watch one porno movie and I would drink a couple of the beers and then I would tend to just live my life for the next four or five hours. And then after everybody went to bed, I would watch the other porno movie and I would drink the other two beers. And that was my life for several years at, at that stage. Uh, I think that I always knew, or at least uh, I knew that I was different than other people. I didn't <laughs> like drinking in groups and crowds. I didn't go to parties in high school, didn't like parties in college. I've never been part of a drinking scene. I'd rather do it by myself. Mm -hmm. With pornography, I remember in high school, I was on the soccer team. And after practice one day, we all went to a friend's house and they popped in a porno movie into the VCR. And people started cracking jokes and laughing. And it was a social event. And we were, you know, it was, it was like Mystery Science Theater 3000 talking to the screen. And uh, I was super, super uncomfortable because that was not my watching porn uh, way of doing things. Porn and it was probably it violated your boundary because you had a it, whole it ritual going with it. It did. It did. And and it was huh. not, you know, it was it was not comfortable for me. So I think I, I recognized then that I looked at porn differently or I was wired differently than my friends. Um, I think that it became very obvious I had a drinking problem mm -hmm. when I started drinking socially at 21 or 22 because I could finally go out to bars. Um, I didn't do that very long because I just, I, I'm not a crowd person. I would rather go out and have a beer with you on a random Wednesday night than a Saturday night uh, because I can hear you talk on a Wednesday night and on a Saturday night, we're packed like sardines. Uh, so I, I was different in that aspect, but I was pretty much told by everybody or people who saw me from about 24 years old onward that I had a drinking problem. Um, when I was at my first rehab, uh, one of the things I'm actually most embarrassed about um, and, and, and shamed about and, and apologetic about is that we had to figure out how many times in our life we drove drunk. And uh, yeah. my number was about 1,500. Oh my uh, gosh. Any accidents? Did you hurt anybody? Did you get hurt? No. Ever a, a DUI? At, never got a DUI because the last several years before I went and got help for my addictions, mm -hmm. I was stopped by cops several times, but I was the guy who was one of the most powerful guys in the media in central Maine. I was on the city council. So guess who set the cops budget? This guy. Wow. And they would let so you police, go. Absolutely. Josh, where are you going? I'm going home. How far is it? Mile and a half, mostly straight. Okay. And said. and now how how does the state of Maine, but the city, because you still live there with your wife and children, how how do they respond to you now that this is all exposed? I'm a ghost. I'm a ghost here. I I, I not participate uh, like I mm -hmm. used to in in uh, activities. Uh, it became uh, it, it became well known that I, I ended up with a porn addiction. Um, it became well known that I was an alcoholic and everybody knew I was an alcoholic anyway. Uh, I think that uh, in a weird way, I think this community has some uh, betrayal trauma from me that I presented okay. myself as one thing while I was something else. 
you know, I, I not unusual imagine, with politicians. We find though, right, right, right. And I think that, well, I think that, I think that a lot of people who are in politics are driven towards it because of stuff that's happened to them. I don't think they develop it once they get there. I think it's, you know, what kind of a, what kind of a person says, what does this area need more of? Me. <laughs> That, that, well, there is a political personality that we in our field in the discipline of psychology. I mean, we there is a political personality, but getting back to you. So when you said that, when I asked you about where do you stand now in your town, you said I'm a ghost. There was a little bit of an emotional response there. And and yet many people would move on. They'd move out of town and you did not. Why did you stay? Because my children were in school, my wife had a good job, and I didn't think that it was fair to let my mistakes, uh, my mistakes are already going to cause mm. them some scars, and we'll see what those are. I didn't think that upending their lives was very fair. Um, if they wanted to move, that was fine. We talked about it. Okay, uh, you we, did. We did talk about, my daughter did change schools for one year ended up going back to her original school. Um, okay. But uh, but I just, and, and my parents are here and they are a fantastic support system. And, uh, my, you know, my therapist is here and she's she's been my therapist now for, for seven, eight years. She's wonderful. Uh, and I, I, work from, I work from home. So it's not like I need to be seeing a ton of people. Um, now, you know, seven, eight years removed mm. from this, I don't mind going out to restaurants um, or to the movie theater or whatnot um, because enough people have forgotten about me. Um, but the first year or two, if I was going out to eat dinner, if I was going to the movies, if I was going shopping, I went 30 miles south to Portland um, because nobody mm. knew who I was there. I felt safer in that environment. Uh, over, as, as time goes on, and you know, I, I, I have learned to deal with my triggers, and I've learned to process this. You know, if somebody came up to me now and was like, "You're a complete loser. I hate you. You're a pervert. I can't believe what you did." I just, you know what? You are working from a set of facts that number one probably aren't correct, and number two, if that's your visceral reaction to me, uh, that's on you, not me. Uh, and, you know? and I also want to address the bipolar, and then I want to ask you. Uh, your family, your wife, your daughter, your son, you're still together. But when did the bipolar? My, my, my daughter just bought a house like a mile and a half from me at, okay. at 21 years old. This girl bought a house. Uh, and uh, so, so she's not living with us right now. And that's, that's a incredible. weird adjustment. That's yes. a weird adjustment. Yeah. But uh, yeah, aside from that, the family unit is, is stronger than it ever has been. And uh, I and asked my you My relationship about with my wife yeah. Is stronger than it ever has been right now. And that is what, when we last met, I was, I was so in awe because a lot of the families that I deal with that have this major trauma, which it is, have not been able to stay together because of all the variables involved. So you're in rehab, you're addressing the porn addiction, the substance, the alcohol, were there any other drugs? Or just no, I have I've I've tried just about everything that's out there. Nothing with okay. a needle, but I tried just about everything. But um, I tell you, nothing hit me like porn like... or like alcohol. Um, when I was 20, 21 years old, prior to being diagnosed bipolar, I would smoke marijuana every day. But when I was 24 and I was properly finally diagnosed bipolar, because I think I'd had it for like five, six years, um, and they put me on the proper meds, mm -hmm. I stopped smoking marijuana within that week. And I probably have smoked marijuana a total of 10 times in my life recreationally since then. I do once in a while. A uh, couple times a week, actually, I should admit, I do take one or two uh, drags of a joint to sleep at night. Okay. Um, and that's that's a medicinal thing. I have my card here in Maine. Um, my doctor doesn't have a problem with it as long as it's one or two drags. Uh, you know, my some of my friends or people who used to know me laugh at me because I could go through two joints in an hour. And now it takes me about 12 days to go through one. Um, 
But your drug of choice then was the pornography and the alcohol. Well, that, that's exactly it. That's exactly okay. it. It's, it's also like, you know, I can go, I can go and uh, I can gamble with no problem. I can go mm. to a casino once, twice a year, mm. win a hundred bucks, lose a hundred bucks and walk away. I don't have that part of the addictive DNA with, uh, with gambling. And I don't think I really have it with marijuana because once I got put on the proper meds, I never felt that desire that I need the marijuana again. I know and, I self-regulated with marijuana and much like the alcohol, much like the porn, I wanted to smoke by myself away from everybody. And, and that's one of the characteristics of addiction is if you are engaging in the drug of choice on your own. Now right. you talked about bipolar and when you started the medications, uh, that the other urges or the other needs decreased. And that brings to mind when we were on a, a again, it was a Sharifa Hardy's show. Uh, there was a conversation that went on. There was a young woman there who was very pro uh, THC marijuana and that oh boy, there was we, no we need. We nailed her to the ground. <laughs> well, and the poor thing, I, I, you know, I felt a little bad. I'm like, Josh, you know, but I, I think at the end of the day, the message that you were trying to get through and, and I was in support of that was, there are individuals that need medication to have a balanced life. And right. you are an incredible example. Now, people with bipolar disorder, historically, one of the issues is not wanting to be compliant or taking the medication because you, yeah, you don't get that high. Uh, tell, tell us a little bit about that. Yeah. I tell you, I remember uh, about six months after I got on the meds and recognized that they had, uh, uh, it almost felt like a restrictor plate in a, in a race car. Good um, way to put it. But I, I remember, I remember telling uh, the, uh, the, the psychiatrist who was uh, prescribing the meds, I remember telling him, I don't know why you are giving me stuff to bring you, to bring me down to your level. You should be giving everybody else stuff to bring them up to my level. Because when you only have to sleep three hours a night and you have constantly creative ideas running through your head and you have this endless supply of energy, that feels great. Mania is awesome. Mania yes. is terrific. And the problem yes. is it, it, it's not that it, it, very early in, in bipolar recovery or bipolar uh, management, you do miss the mania. But I found, and I've taken myself off of my pills twice, the big mistakes, I, I, because I, I fall into that category like everybody else. Mm -hmm. You lull yourself into believing that you're okay now. You're like the other people now. It's like, you know, you break your leg, eventually it heals. Your leg is now like the other people's legs. It, it, and I think that's the way year after year, you're lulled into believing, you know, I'm not crazy anymore. I'm not depressed anymore. I'm not doing stupid stuff anymore. So, okay, well, you know, my meds are all the way on the other side of the house. I'm just going to go to bed. And tomorrow night, oh, my meds are way over there again. Uh, you know what? I'm feeling fine. Whatever. Maybe I don't even need these anymore. Whatever. And then you just kind of take yourself off of them because you think that you're better than you used to be. And oh, about two, three weeks into it, you start to see some cracks or you don't see the cracks, hmm. but the world starts to see the cracks. And, you know, both times this has happened, my wife has been like, are you taking your meds? Or if you are, do we need to yeah. up them? Um, you know, do you, I, I'm going to start counting your pills because it doesn't seem like they're going anywhere. And there was one point where I would actually go get this. This is how, 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 you know, uh, twisted the mind of, of a bipolar person is I would go and get my pills and then throw them away because yeah. <laughs> I just didn't want to take them. It's like, it's like walking in on your kid when you tell them to go brush their teeth and they're standing there with the water on and the, and the toothbrush under the water. So it gets wet. And it's like, if you're standing here, pulling this act just brush your damn teeth and it's like okay i'm here throwing my pills away just you know the pills make you okay just take them and it's a lesson that i think you know just about everybody i've ever met with bipolar and especially people like me who have now been diagnosed 
20, 25 years with it. Hmm. Uh, we all have a story or two like this where yeah. we made a mistake and, and forgot that what we have is something that's more like uh, diabetes in that we have a condition that is going to need lifelong management. And I, I, I had the privilege for years of working in the emergency rooms as a behavioral health provider, psychologist, and a lot of the individuals that we would see, that I would see and care for, did have bipolar and, and had stopped taking their meds. And what it, the mania or the very lows, the depression, uh, were, were at such extremes, but the wonderful thing was to see once they were stabilized, the individual functioning at a level that was at a balance, but to hear their stories uh, was incredible. So you have the pornography addiction, the bipolar, the early, early childhood trauma, post-traumatic stress without a doubt, the alcohol, and you get married. At what age did you get married? Uh, I met my wife uh, shortly after my 26th birthday. And then about a year and a half later, we were married. Wow, so that was quick. Yeah, okay. well, you know, I, uh, I don't know if I've ever said this on a, on a podcast, but uh, probably about six weeks after meeting her, I got her pregnant. Um, and okay. it was, it was not planned, but, uh, we had a very intense, we, we talked on the phone for about a month before we ever met. And, uh, every night I hate the phone with a passion. Uh, and I really did back then. And I didn't want to talk to people for more than three minutes because it reminded me of work as a journalist, you know, asking mm. questions and I didn't like, it. you know, you don't want to do what you do for work at home. So I didn't talk to people on the phone. But I could talk to her for four or five, six hours every night. And because she was living, you know, 40 miles away from me, and we both had busy lives, we didn't get to meet for about a month. How did and you then, meet her initially? Uh, I met her online. This online. Was, this okay. Was, That's... And this was back in 2002 when it wasn't exactly yeah. uh, cool to do that. Uh, meeting people online back then was like personal ads. People looked at them that, okay. that poorly. Um but we met each other online and uh, yeah, we, we, we hit it off. And uh, six weeks after us actually meeting each other and being with each other almost every day, either I'd drive back to her town or she'd drive back to my town. Hmm. And uh, we, uh, she said, she, my daughter uh, was, is not my biological daughter. She was two years old at the time, my, my wife's biological daughter. And uh, my wife, my, at that point, girlfriend told me, you know, I am feeling very much like I felt when I was pregnant with her for the last mm. week or two. And I was like, okay, well, I get, and I'd never had a pregnancy scare with any girlfriend or anything like that. So I was like, okay, what do we do next? Here I am, you know, 25, 26, what do we do next? And she's like, well, I think you should go to the store and buy two different pregnancy tests. So we can do them both and see what happens. And I went to the store, which was around the corner from my apartment. She came back and she peed on the sticks and left them in the bathroom. And we watched TV for a half hour. And then we went back and both of them said pregnant. And Did you feel at that moment? Uh, Did you have a couple of drinks and a joint? <laughs> no, no, no. I had stopped, I had stopped smoking by then. Mm. Um, I stopped smoking around 23 probably. Um, I, I have this ability to, to be in an intense situation and not necessarily fully detach, but not let stuff wash over me too hard. I've been in a lot of intense situations in life and, uh, I, I, I don't let things attack me too much. And honestly, things that are new to me, even when some people would say this is horrible, I find new stuff interesting. I find new stuff fascinating. So, oh my goodness, she's pregnant. Well, I wonder what happens next. That's, that's <laughs> that be curious to journalism. Yeah, I wonder, I just, I wonder what happens next. Um, and uh, I, 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 I guess I would say, um, <sighs> I, 
I had sowed enough of my uh, oats and that, and I was in for the first time a management position within journalism. Mm. So I felt pretty secure uh, in who I was or what I was. And I knew I really liked her. Um, so it was interesting timing because this was early uh, summer, maybe, maybe late spring. My parents were going on a one month vacation uh, cross country to visit my brother in Los Angeles. So they asked me if I wanted, again, they knew that I was uh, going to be between apartments. So they asked if I wanted to watch the house. Well, the house is in the town where my girlfriend was living. So I took over the house and she basically lived with me. And after a few days, it's like, this is, I like this. So uh, I basically, you know, got a ring and asked her to marry me. Um, I don't know if that was my Catholic upbringing kicking in. I'm <laughs> Catholic to, too. We have uh, to add that to the equation yeah, too. <laughs> yeah, I don't. I don't know. If, I don't know if she. Uh, I don't know if that had anything to do with it, or it was just that I was done with this other life and I was ready for something different. And her daughter and I got along so well uh, that to welcome this little girl into my life was going to be amazing. So uh, I I asked her to marry me, and she said yes. And a whole lot of people were surprised. And I guess on paper, with the amount of time that we had been together, um, we probably shouldn't have survived, especially with what I dragged her through with my addiction. But we have always survived. We've always been very fond of each other. We've always, uh, you know, we've always had each other's back. Uh, she is mm. not a romantic person whatsoever. And I think I let her have that space. Uh, I'm probably more than she is, and I'm probably still way less than most men. Um, so there, there were, there were uh, personality quirks within each of us that I think would get on other people's nerves. And there were things that we find funny that I know a lot of people don't. Um, and I, we, we get along very well. And uh, How long are also, you married now? Uh Coming up this June will be 18 years. Oh my gosh, Did, was she aware of the addictions and the bipolar when you married her? She was well aware of the bipolar. I never tried to hide that whatsoever. Mm -hmm. uh, she, uh, I think, figured out that I drank more than other people and I could not be a social drinker. Uh, if the if the situation provided itself to be a social drinker, I didn't take it. If I went to a family party, everybody else had one or two beers or a glass or two of wine. I didn't drink because I couldn't have one or two. So and you I reframed, which is very difficult. Yep. Wow. Yep. And and I I would rather us uh, be at home drinking, or I'd rather you know uh, if I went out with some friends, I might drink too much. But she was more apt to find me at my office drinking too much because I had a fridge there or find me at the bar. Uh, I, my ironically, my office was upstairs from a brew pub um, and uh, she might find me there. Uh, that's usually where I drove home from. But uh, she, she she recognized that I could not be a healthy drinker, but didn't get on me too much unless she knew I was drunk driving. When did um, she? Uh, yes. And, and good reason to get on you. Yeah, yeah. Um, when did you tell her about the pornography and, and did your history with pornography affect the intimacy in your marriage? Um, as far as before, I mean, she was never a, you know, Puritan anti porn type person. I think she had the attitude that guys will be guys. Guys occasionally look mm. at porn on the computer. It's no big deal. She was not anti-porn by any means. I remember one time uh, we went to we went on a little mini vacation for a long weekend, and the hotel that we were at. This is probably two three years into being married. The hotel we were at had, as they did back then, the pay-per-view pornography, and mm. she rented one ironically as a joke, like for us to make fun of much like the guys in high school did. Uh, and uh, so she didn't have, she was not anti-pornography. 
that made it a little bit easier to be a porn addict, especially when times were good. When times were good, I was probably using my porn three, four times a day. Where? Um, how would you do that between work and home? How did, how did you maneuver that? Even despite the fact that I uh, was on my bipolar pills, mm -hmm. still am to this day, I don't need more than five hours of sleep at night. So the porn was usually very late at night when everybody was asleep um, or it was when nobody was home. Um, when you're a porn addict, you know, you can, I can find 50 different times during the day when you look at pornography, you know, I, if I'm a porn addict, I can be looking at porn right now on my phone, on the side of the screen, whatever it is, and you would never know it. Because would you be you know, self-stimulating or is it all in your, in other words, are you creating the fantasies and then the, achieving the, the orgasm in your head? Uh, if you are, well, help us understand a little yeah, bit more well, about I, that. I think what, one thing people have to understand is that addiction to pornography and addiction to masturbation are two different things. How? Tell us how. We need to, we need to know. We need to learn. It's like, uh, it, they're two different activities. Now, much like Reese's peanut butter cups with peanut butter and chocolate, they go together. But um, here's, here's a, when, when I coach guys now, or guys approach me and ask about pornography or, addic or, or masturbation, when I stopped watching pornography, um, I probably 95% stopped masturbation. Masturbation, masturbation okay. in pornography for me was like the checkered flag at, at the end of the race. It was the way that I knew I got the dopamine that I needed. The dopamine, um, hit the orgasm. Exactly. That that's okay. what it was. And I think that uh, I, one of the things that I tell guys who uh, I, I who are engaged in this activity is if you're going to get better, figure out what you're addicted to. Many guys are addicted to both. I was just pornography, but discovered that after porn stopped. If a guy listening is involved in both, try this experiment. For the next two weeks, you can look at porn. Look at it as much as you want. Do not masturbate. Mm. However, go ahead and masturbate. Just don't do it to any visual material. By the end of the two weeks, you're going to know what the problem is because you are going to feel a greater urge towards one of those two things. Okay. And for me, it was the pornography. And I can tell you at the end of my addictions that at the end of the addiction, I wasn't even self-satisfying at that point. It, I did hmm. not look at porn m towards the end of my addictions as I, I didn't need to masturbate. I didn't care if I masturbated. And with me, um, the, the other thing that I point out to people, and I, I do a lot of betrayal trauma counseling now. That's where I I've, saw that. I've, I've yeah. moved into the coaching and I, I have a lot of that. One of the first things that I have to tell uh, the, the wives and girlfriends of porn addicts is that they didn't stop or they haven't stopped having sex with you because they, they are choosing the women in the porn. It's, it's not that. It's that they're an addict. And if you look at, you know, ask a heroin addict how much sex they want to have. It's zero, mm -hmm. you know, un unless you're on some crazy stimulant like cocaine or Molly, you're not going to right. want to have sex. And that is true. You know, gambling addicts have less sex, almost alcoholics, less sex, almost everybody has less sex when they're an addict. And that carries over into porn addiction too. But because we're talking about a, a an addiction that involves naked people it involves sexuality it involves orgasm we confuse the fact that it involves the intimate act of intercourse with a loved one in bed it's not and you know it's it's not that i was ever uh shooting down my wife and, and a lot of times i didn't because what i got out of out of intercourse with my wife was a sense of love was a sense of touch was a sense of intimacy. Um, different than the porn or the masturbation. Right. Because did, did your wife feel betrayed by the porn or the masturbation? Because a lot of women I talk to or partners in same sex uh, relationships feel there is a betrayal. No, the only time, I think the only time she felt betrayed was when uh, 
uh, I went into, and I went into uh, therapy, or I'm sorry, I went into rehab for alcoholism uh, 2014, and I was there for 10 weeks in California. Uh, and then in 2015, I, I came back home and I started to get into deep therapy, started to do a lot of research because that's my way of doing things. And, and I, I, I yes. dabbled with 12 steps, but it was never quite my personality. Um, and uh, hmm. Okay. And I'm glad to hear you say that because the 12 steps are monumental, but for some individuals, they need other sources. Right. Oh, and, 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 and the okay. base, the base, the basis for the twelve steps was good for me, but okay. my healing was far beyond just not drinking or just not using porn. And what I saw was a lot of people who were not in healing; they were in a purgatory of not using their substance, but were still addicted in their head. Uh, and that wasn't healthy for me, especially with Sex Addicts mm -hmm. Anonymous. Sex Addicts Anonymous was a bunch of guys who were complaining about their wives. And that Interesting. didn't help me whatsoever. So I left there even sooner than I left AA. Uh, but I found that I, 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 I got what I could out of the basic program, but I did not mesh well with the people there. Uh, and you know, I don't mesh well with a lot of people. So. But, that, but that's uh, why I love you. And that's why we get yeah. along. I have to ask you, your family together, your wife, son, your daughter, what if there was one thing that kept the family together, what would that be? Um, my wife, my wife's mama bear mentality, my wife's hold the family together. Strong woman. Mentality. Mm -hmm. um, my wife being a healthcare worker and a caregiver who recognized very fast that uh, um, I was sick beyond uh, having a moral issue, sick beyond being an evil guy, sick beyond being mm -hmm. a pervert um, that I actually had. And she, she thankfully knew enough about addiction to appreciate the fact that it's a disease. What um, do you tell your children? What do you tell your son? How do you teach them about what to look for in, in all of the above? Trauma, uh, addiction, choices. Well, when it comes to when it comes to making the bad choices that can lead to uh, Hold on. Uh, what, what, what was the bad choice? I lost you there. Okay, Say that there? again. I'm here. Yeah, yeah I just okay. the mute one up. I know. Um, and uh, talking about bad choices, I let them know that with addiction, as I let everybody know, addiction was not the problem. Addiction was a symptom of the problem. Addiction is what grew out of the problem. Um, I've been doing enough betrayal trauma work now that I believe if you don't deal with the betrayal um, of that trauma, I believe you end up as a, as a addict. Um, okay. I think that the stop, the next stop mm -hmm. after not dealing with trauma, especially betrayal trauma is addiction, in, in, in my opinion, the people I've been talking with. Um, and I try to make them understand that, you know, if you have problems, let's talk mm -hmm. about them. Let's get you help. My son, uh, he's now, eight, he just turned 18 years old. He's a senior in high school. He's been going to a therapist since he was a freshman. Um, okay. And I never went to one till I was 20. My parents were of that generation of, if you can't see the boo-boo, you don't have the boo-boo. Mm -hmm. And even once I started going, again, this is with my mom, I think she doesn't want to think that she had anything to do with this it's uh, to too cause, painful to what what is your son mental. what is your son going to therapy for if you choose to disclose that uh i think he a lot like me in in, in my early therapy mm -hmm. just needs somebody to work things out with mm -hmm. outside of the family outside of his day-to-day -day life um, who can give him perspectives that you know, I could say the same thing, but he could ask himself, why am I saying this? 
Is there incentive for me to push him into a certain direction? Um, you know, is there uh, is there an agenda for me pushing him into a certain direction? Which hmm. a lot of the times when you're parents, the answer is yes, absolutely. There's an agenda, and that's not a bad thing. But I think he has, especially as he's gotten older, there's a freedom in talking about certain things with him. My son is far more of an empath, far more of a sweet guy, far more of a, a feeler than either my wife or I. And, and, and I would say, and I've known you a bit now because we've, we've done several shows together as guests, but that he's a lot like his dad. So here we are towards the end of the show. How would you describe yourself in one word, Josh? That's all I'm giving you. One word. One word. Uh, awesome. Okay. Uh, I, awesome, creative. I mean, I don't know. I think, I think that's, I, I'll be honest. I think that's a lame question. Uh, yeah, it, so it can more, be. Or here, here it is. Complex. Complex. One word. Okay. And I ask certain questions because from a psychological perspective, it tells me a lot. But I also want you to tell our audience, to tell us, how can people reach you? I want to hear about the books, again, about the website. How can people get in touch with you? How can, how can people access the information that you've put out there? Yeah, I'll make it super easy for everybody. Um, I am on Twitter. I am on Instagram. I post every day on those. Uh, and if you, you know, and you get my person, especially on Instagram, you get my personality. I post as much inspirational stuff as I post crazy jokes. Uh, you know, okay. I, I finally shaved after six months yesterday. <laughs> I, I, I thought there was something different about you. If, you, you. <laughs> if, you, if you go on Instagram, you'll see a step-by-step -step breakdown of my shaving. Oh, I'll have to watch it. Because I thought it was funny. Um, so if you want to find me on there, the the handle is P, the letter P, Addict Recovery. That's both Twitter and uh, and uh, Instagram. I am on LinkedIn under my my name, Joshua Shea. Uh, and then if you go to my website, Recovering Porn Addict, uh, that's how you can get access to my books. It is on Amazon. You can look up my name as well. Okay. But you can go to my website, recoveringpornaddict.com. My books are there. Information about my coaching is there, both for porn addicts and for uh, people suffering with betrayal trauma, especially if it's in a, a an unhealthy sexual way. And then um, I also have there that, that I released not too long ago, an online uh, uh, course for people who maybe they're a little leery of working with somebody one-on-one, -on -one, or maybe they don't have the money to work with someone one-on-one. -on -one. I do have an online course there that I think is only $40 that takes people through the basics at least, uh, if you are a partner of a porn addict and you're not sure what to do. So I also, um, there, there's plenty of articles there. There are a lot of resources. There's, there's the names of inpatient clinics. There's the names of online forums. Uh, different places. I have a bunch of articles posted there uh, that can, can lead you to more information. Um, I believe ultimately you need to uh, you need to really educate yourself and really understand about pornography. And I think society does. If we're going to deal with this, it's going to mm -hmm. come with the next generation. Yes. So we need to we need to deal with that. Mm -hmm. And and if you look at it, you and I have been talking here for an hour. We have not described what we've ever seen on the pages of pornography or on the screen mm -hmm. once. We don't have to make this a graphic discussion, but we do mm -hmm. have to make it a discussion that we have because it's it's so out there in society. Anybody can be a porn addict. If I, a business owner who was prominent in my community with a wife and kids, very white collar, if I can be a porn addict, almost anybody can. And I have met men and women, black, white, Asian, Latino, smart, stupid, rich, poor. I've met every type of person who can who has been a porn addict. So there is no stereotype one. Right. And you know, the final message I want to send is if you think you have a problem, you probably do. Because you don't think you have a problem with vacuuming too much, I bet. And I <laughs> bet you I bet you don't think you have a problem with brushing your teeth too much. But you're questioning whether you have a problem with this. If you're questioning you have a problem, you probably do. 
talk to a therapist, talk to a coach, do research, whatever it is. Don't just sit there. Um, don't let it get out of control like I did for years and years. Get some help. And that's how we're going to start uh, demystifying this, mm -hmm. get it, getting so much of the stigma away from it and actually accepting the fact that unfortunately in 2021, pornography addiction, uh, poor practices, bad habits with pornography are very common and we need education around it. I want to thank you for the privilege of having you on Inside America's Minds. Thank you so much. And I have a feeling we're probably going to have to have you back. That, that happens with a lot of shows. I and, bet, uh, because like you said, it's a topic. It's, it's growing. Yeah. Um, and it need, we need to educate. Josh, take good care. And I'll you see too. you soon. Thank All you. Right. Thank you, Jody.